the parable of the sower, which uh, Jesus not only tells, but he, he also explains to his disciples on this occasion. He tells the story. He doesn't always explain the stories, but he does on this occasion. The one that we want to look at for the next few minutes, though, uh, Jesus also explains. And so we should really have very little question about what it means, because Jesus tells us what it means. So the meaning is an easy thing for us if we trust the Lord. Let's read this story Jesus told as he said it, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, King of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the weeds and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let us uh, let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now the first story he tells in that chapter on that occasion, uh, the one called the parable of the sower often, involved a man who sowed a field with a seed, and the emphasis there, if you remember, is on the different kinds of soil that the seed fell upon, and uh, whether the, the seed was able to bear lasting fruit uh, based on where it fell. In this story that we've read, the emphasis is on the type of seed in the field. Two kinds of seed are sown in this field, right? Uh, one is, is planted by the master of the field. It's good. It is hardy wheat seed. But then one night the enemy comes and, and goes into the field and, and sows weeds. Some translations uh, render that tares, T-A-R-E-S. So this parable of Jesus is often called the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, to understand what's going on here, a helpful insight into the Lord's story is, is to understand what kind of seed specifically is being referred to here most likely. The good seed, of course, sowed by the owner of the field is wheat. And then the weeds are probably from a seed that, that yields something usually called darnel. Uh, which is actually a, a different thing entirely from wheat and can actually be poisonous if it's ingested. The problem is when these two types of seeds are first growing in the early stages, you can't easily tell them apart. And if you have no experience, it's probably impossible to tell them apart. They look identical. And then by the time you can actually tell them apart, it's really too late to do much about it. So, so what happens is, is this, by the, you know, they, they look the same early on, but as they mature, the, the good wheat will have sort of a yellowish tint to it, while the darnel, the bad stuff, will appear much darker as it matures, sort of a charcoal color. By the time you can tell them apart like this, what has happened below the surface of the soil is that the root systems have become totally enmeshed and entwined. And so if you're going to pull up the darnel, you're going to pull up the wheat at the same time. 
And so we have a problem, don't we? And this is the turn that the story takes where Jesus is going to make his application eventually. So in the story, again, the field workers, they come to the master, they ask him, what do we do? Uh, should, should they take this problem head on and attack it and, and go out into the fields and pull up the weeds? My dad was a really good gardener. He was the one with the green thumb in the family. I did not inherit that gene. He raised uh, vegetable gardens, but um, he, he, he raised a lot of flower gardens, and they were beautiful. But most of the time, he didn't want me to weed his gardens probably because of the bad experience he had the first time he asked me to do it. Son, after supper tonight, I want you to go out back and pull those weeds. Okay, Dad. Well, you know the conversation the next day, right? Son, where are the flowers? Not that I ever did that on purpose, of course. Not that I had something else I wanted to be doing, shooting baskets or committing other misdemeanors in the neighborhood. But sometimes if you're not as careful as you should be, as my, my wife has learned when she's given me such assignments, if you're not as careful as you should be or you don't know the difference between a flower and a weed, you can make a big mess out of things, can't you? In the Lord's story, the owner of the field is, is a wise man. He understands this basic principle. He knows his farming. You don't go out into the field and yank up all the weeds when the roots are entwined and, and enmeshed with the good stuff so much that you might destroy all the good stuff. He might destroy the crop entirely. And so, of course, he tells his servants to wait until harvest. Wait until harvest time. Once all the plants, good and bad, are ready, they'll, they'll be pulled up, and then they can be separated. The good, the good wheat, it can be used. The weeds can be destroyed. But this course isn't just an interesting farming story that Jesus tells about wheat and weeds. A little later in the chapter, Matthew 13, the Lord sits down with his disciples and explains the point, explains what they should get from this. This comes in verse 36 of the chapter. Let's hear what the Lord said to them. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. I think we can be confident that Jesus thought this was very important material. A very important teaching because he takes the time to explain the story in detail. 
He didn't want any of his followers to miss the lesson. And folks, that includes you and me today. He didn't want us to miss the lesson. This is indeed an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Or as uh, another definition of what a parable is, this story is, is a way of explaining supernatural things in natural language. So what is the supernatural truth that this farming story is designed to express? Well, I would underline, first of all, the opening phrase of verse 38, where Jesus says, the field is the world. The field in this story represents the entire world. Jesus says that the owner of the field who sows the good seed is himself. It's the Lord. And the good seed that he sows in that field of the world are the children of the kingdom of heaven. The weeds, on the other hand, are the children of the evil one, the devil, who, of course, is the one who, who sows these weeds in the world. Harvest time in the story represents the end of the age, the close of time. And the reapers in the story are the holy angels of God. So what is the picture painted here for us? God has planted a kingdom in this world, and he has put his people in this kingdom. They are good people, productive people, fruitful people. They are true servants of God. But do you know where they live? They live in the world right beside some people who serve a different master. People who serve Satan. So living side by side in this world, you have people who serve God and people who serve the devil. And, and they start out looking just like one another. For a long time, you can't tell them apart. They are all human beings, after all. They are all born with the image of God. They share, share this world. They grow together. They look a lot alike many times. But you see, one is healthy and good and productive, and one is bad and diseased and destructive. So, Lord, what should we do in this world? Should we go out with a sickle? Or maybe fire? And try to pull up all the weeds, fix it, fix things and, until all that are left are those that we deem worthy? Is that what we should do, Lord? Should we destroy the bad? And try to preserve the good by whatever means necessary? Should we try and fix this world, Lord? Jesus answers, no. You can't fix this world. You'll just make a bigger mess of what the devil has started. Jesus says, you let me do the fixing. You let me do the sorting, the weeding at the end of time. A day is coming when I will send my angels and they will separate the good from the bad. They will find the sinners. They will detect the lawbreakers and they will gather them up and separate them out and throw them into the fiery furnace. Folks, we are never given the authority to be the final judge. We are not given the authority to be judge and jury of people in this world. And any time we try to do that, we overstep our bounds. That is God's job. He doesn't need any help with it. Jesus is going to take care of all of that on the great last day. And so we ought to be very careful of trying to do 
God's job for him. Right? Now the other extreme of this is to take this truth and say, we're not allowed to be the judge. So God's going to save everyone. That is ridiculous, according to what Jesus says here, isn't it? He says clearly, a day is coming when God will judge the wicked, and they will be sent to a place of punishment where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew, the, the gospel writer, says that specifically four or five times in his gospel. And the world needs to hear that message as well. A real day is coming, a day of judgment, when people will be sent to a real place of punishment, a place of pain and torment. God decides who goes there. I don't. Neither do you. God decides. But it will happen. Be aware of anybody that tries to tell you something different. Because they're contradicting the Lord. And so, that day is coming. And, and in addition, any pretend believers out there who are not really committed to Jesus, they need to hear that as well. Because the Lord says of them that they will be rooted up. But then on the other hand, there's a real place of reward as well. Notice what Jesus says at the close of his application, verse 43. That the saved, the righteous, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. There's a a glorious place prepared for the faithful, the fruitful. Never forget that. There is a place where we will reflect God's glory for eternity. He who has ears, let him hear. I, I challenge you today to go home sometime today and read verses 47 through 50 of this same chapter, Jesus thought the point of this parable was so important that he told another story with the exact same message, just different details. This time, the illustration is fishing. It teaches the exact same point. God is the judge. And God is fully up to that task and does not need help from us with it. He will do the sorting, and he will do either the punishing or the rewarding. Our task is to make sure we are wheat, that we are fruitful and productive and faithful and all those good things, that we are feeding the good side of our nature every day and that we're growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that begins with being in Jesus Christ it can't happen unless we're in Jesus Christ you see so folks harvest day is coming soon and we just ask you this morning if you're ready are you ready for harvest day? That is a question worth thinking about. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for your love given us in Jesus, your son. We thank you that he went to the cross for us and, and that you raised him from the dead. 
And Father, we ask you to just give us courage this morning as we receive your word. And if we need to respond in some way, that you will help us to do what's right, to be ready for harvest. Thank you for every blessing, including just the blessing of being with people we love this morning. Uh, help us to see the opportunities you give us today and the rest of the week to, to serve others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we conclude, we're offering the invitation of Jesus to any who might be here in need, spiritual or otherwise. If we can pray with you about something, serve you in some way, if we can help you in your obedience to the Lord, we want to do that before our assembly closes. Just let us know by, by coming to the front while we stand and sing this song.